I think last week when uh, they announced that uh, we, we had the devotional available, you went to the Connect desk and they were all gone. Well, they have more for you today, so the devotional book is available at all three Connect desks in the middle and in both entrances and exits, so you can pick it up there. Of course, you can get it online or get it texted to you in the morning if you want, if you text that number that you saw earlier. I, have, I do want to say as well, we're talking about if you need a Bible. If anybody needs a Bible, uh, just take one that's in the, the, the seat in front of you. Uh, it's okay. It's not stealing. Uh, you have my permission. Just take a Bible if you don't have one. It, it's so important we'll be talking about the importance of the Word today in our lives. Let's be praying for our middle school students as they'll be coming back from a retreat uh, in a little while, and uh, they may be getting close to being on the road now. We pray for them for safety and that God would just uh, kind of close off the retreat strong for them. Uh, I also talked to Chris Brooks last night, Pastor Chris, is representing us in Thailand, and he'd sent me a picture earlier in the week. I thought you'd enjoy this. It's a picture of him along with Aka John. <laughs> They're two great men of faith, but there's got to be a foot difference between them. I don't know. <laughs> But uh, they'll, uh, they're going to share more of the story next week of the trip, uh, have some video as well. But they actually dedicated the building, and you see the, the plaque there, and it's just it's amazing. So thanks again. You're making an impact just by your gifts um, around the world. I can tell you stories. We'll do a little bit of that next week, uh, and then more to come later. But I just know you're making a difference in the Aka tribe of two and a half million people who have the gospel coming to them in six different countries because we wanted to have a little orphanage in the hill country outside of Shanghai, not understanding what God was going to do and how he was going to really parlay that for a, a massive evangelistic effort uh, through that tribe. So thank you for your giving. Well, um, I had the opportunity, any golfers here? A few of you, yeah. I, I got, I, years ago, I played a golf course just north of Grand Rapids. It's called Pilgrim's Run, um, and it's, the reason it's called that because every hole in the golf course is patterned after the story or one of the characters in Pilgrim's Progress. So it's like a Christian golf course. So to golf, it is actually worship. <laughs> um, we, I was golfing with a friend of mine, and he had two friends with him that I didn't know. And so we get, we're getting to know each other during the first nine. We finish the, the first nine and we turn the corner uh, to hole number 10. And it's a short par four uh, with a tree kind of uh, blocking a little bit of the green uh, so you couldn't, uh, couldn't approach it real well. I took out a driver and one of the guys in the foursome said, uh, I wouldn't use a driver here. And I said, well, really, why not? He said, you don't need it. He said, if you just take a three-wood, hit a three-wood 200 yards or so, and then you can take another club, approach iron, and put it on the green, and two-putt, you got your par, and go on to number 11. So I thought, I want to use my driver. <laughs> but I followed his advice, and I'm glad I did. I hit it out there like he said. I put it on the green, two-putted for a par, and walked to the next tee. And I said to the man who gave me the advice, I said, but well, thanks, you know, for that advice. It worked out. Well, he said, my family owns this course, and I designed that hole. <laughs> um, I learned then, you got to listen to the designer. You got to listen to the designer. God's designed our lives, and he's designed this book. He's designed a plan of salvation for each one of us, and we have to listen to the designer. Jesus was sharing uh, some things about the Word in a message he was preaching on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee uh, to a group of disciples, and I think broader than that, uh, there were others there perhaps, and even some Pharisees that were in the midst. You may want to join me in your Bibles in Matthew chapter 5. The message covers Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, when you look at this, the, the passage of Scripture, this is so, so important because we need uh, people in our lives. The designer is God, and he needs to speak, and Jesus did, and he could, because he's the author and the finisher of our faith. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, that he is the Word, uh, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
that he was in the presence of God, being God himself. He is the eternal one. And he had an eternal plan for us that was uh, put in the scriptures. We read about it in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, where it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for uh, correction and instruction in righteousness that the men and women of God might be perfect or mature, uh, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so we have to listen to the designer. The, the main questions that we have in life, what am I worth? Why am I here? What is my value? What is the meaning of life? And where do I go from here? All of those are answered in this book. Therefore, it's so important, it's incumbent upon us to look into this word, but to do it properly. By that I mean, there are some people who will neglect the book. I mean, they'll dust it off whenever they're in the valley and they're looking for some psalm to kind of lift their spirit. Or they'll dust it off when they're ready to go to church or to a Bible study. Um, or when grandma is coming over, they'll uh, dust it off. Some people, they do more than neglect. They'll get into the word, but they'll pick and choose. I want to obey this passage. I don't even like that passage. I don't know why it's there. I don't believe it. They'll pick and choose. You can't do that. Some people do that with the Old Testament. The Old Testament is of little value. Other people say, no, I just focus on the red letters of Scripture. If Jesus didn't say it, I'm not buying it. And all those are wrong, and Jesus is going to share that here. Because Jesus, as the designer, knows not only, he shows us how to live, but he also shows us what to believe. He knows the Bible better than we do. So we get to this section of the Sermon on the Mount, and really this, the body of the message begins in verse 17. And he's going to answer the question, does the teaching of the Old Testament even apply to today? And Jesus will share two truths with us. The first one is we can't disconnect from the Old Testament. Notice what it says in verse number 17, 17 and 18. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. God gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. And then later, God gave the rest of what we would call the Torah, um, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. All were given to the children of Israel and to us through the writing of Moses inspired by the Holy Spirit. And so just as God gave the law an amount, Jesus now in another mount. And you have to envision this in the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. By mountain, it's not, this is a large hill. And if, if you're on the hill and you're looking down at Jesus and behind him to the south is the beautiful Sea of Galilee. And Jesus is now talking to them and sharing with them on this mount as he's going to declare in this sermon that doesn't take long to read. And yet books and books and books have been written about this sermon that's deemed to be the best sermon ever preached. And Jesus will say, you know, the law and the prophets, they're intact. Not one little iota, a little letter, or a dot should be removed from the law or the prophets until all is fulfilled. And later he would say, I'm the one who is fulfilling it. Not at all. Jesus was saying, and Jesus, when he talked about the Old Testament, he referred to it in three uh, segments or, or uh, uh, um, groups. First of all, the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, first five books. The prophets, those prophets were the big names, uh, the big books with a, a man's name at the top, uh, Ezekiel, Daniel. Isaiah, Jeremiah, and then the 12 little books, so the 12 little prophets. And this is where the pages of your Old Testament stick together. We don't get into them that often. Um, those are the prophets. And then the third group is the writings. And the writings included a couple of groups, the history, the historical books, like Joshua and Judges and uh, uh, First and Second Samuel and um, uh, Chronicles, as well as wisdom literature. Uh, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon would all fit in there. So Jesus referred to all of these as very, very valuable. 
And he was the fulfillment of all of that. And so what he's saying to them, and this was very, very bold, because there were Pharisees perhaps, there were certainly Pharisees at the time, whether they're Pharisees on the side of that uh, hill, I don't know, I think there were. But Jesus was saying to them, you are misinterpreting the law. And they are saying to Jesus, you've got it wrong. You've got it wrong. You're misreading it. But when Jesus said, nothing shall pass away until all is fulfilled, this is important. It's not abolished. It's fulfilled. What he was saying was extremely bold. Extremely bold. He's saying all those prophecies from Jeremiah, from Daniel, Ezekiel, all the minor prophets, Micah, when they point to the Messiah, that's all fulfilled in me. This had to be very disruptive to the Pharisees. What I want to suggest to you, more than suggest, is that our beliefs determine our behavior. Our lives, the way we live our lives, is based on what we believe. Do you believe that? So corrupt thinking will always in time lead to corrupt living. We know that when we're, we're rearing our children, um, when, our, when a child does something wrong, you want to change the behavior. And yet everybody almost always acts in ways that make sense to them. It fits within their belief system. So if you want to change long-term behavior, you have to go back and change the belief system. And so that's why the Bible says to us, let every thought be brought into the captivity of Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. Every thought. So our belief system has to be based on God, Jesus Christ, and the Word of God. And then that will affect our behavior. Beliefs are important. When you think of... Um, the word evangelical is used a lot. It has been used a lot in the last few years. And let me take you back for a moment. Do we, do we know what the word means? Anybody does not know what the word means? Okay, this is 11.30. We can respond now. Everybody's out. <laughs> let me just quickly describe. I'm going to go really fast. Um, in the macro view, when the church was started in, uh, um, in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, the church started and they, they focused on the Word of God and the teaching of the Word of God. They met every day. And the church grew and multiplied and spread through persecution and through missionary work uh, to, throughout all the known world. And then you had branches develop. And in 1054, you had the Catholic Church and the Orthodox Church split. And those were the two big branches, although you had lots and lots and lots of little groups that were formed that, that uh, they, they, many of them intended to live by the Word of God as it was taught in the first century. Some would get caught up in little uh, side doctrines, that kind of thing. But you had the Lollers and the, uh, Wal uh, the uh, Walgenses and the Albigenses and uh, all of these different groups, the Baptists and the Anabaptists. And then around 1500, the Reformation began. When the Reformation started with uh, the big guys, Luther and Calvin, Knox, what they were trying to do was emphasize some of the doctrines that had been neglected or forgotten or distorted over the course of centuries. One of them was the inspiration of the scriptures. The Bible is the inspired word of God. It's authoritative. It's without error in its original manuscripts. They wanted to emphasize the justification by faith alone, that one can only come to Jesus by faith. They wanted to emphasize the priesthood of the believer, that every person who, fought, who knew Jesus Christ by name could go to him directly and didn't have to go through an intermediary. Aren't you glad of that? But they also, in the priesthood of the believer, it also emphasized that every believer has gifts that they can use to build up the body of Christ. So those things were emphasized during the Reformation time period. And so a whole new direction, a whole new group of Protestants developed. And of the group of Protestants, then there were, there were, there were groups that would, would break off or, or start uh, that were, would emphasize a particular doctrine. It may have been Lutherans, it may have been um, uh, the Presbyterians, or it may have been a Baptist, or uh, certainly a, a Methodist under Wesley. And all those groups had a lot of things in common 
although they may emphasize one doctrine over another or they're following a leader. And then when you enter into the 20th century, there were two basic groups of, of Protestants that would fit, not by denomination necessarily, but by, uh, by belief system. And they were called at that time in the 20s, the modernist and the fundamentalist. And the fundamentalist is really what it sounded like. The fundamentalist believed in the fundamentals of the faith. Um, those were written by uh, basically R.A. Torrey in 1909, and he said, if you're going to be a, a fundamentalist, you have to believe in the inspiration of the scriptures, the substitutionary work of Jesus Christ on the cross. You have to believe in the visible return of Jesus. These five basic things that you had to believe in. Um, whereas the modernists, no, not so much. They were more concerned about... Uh, um, um, doing, being good, doing good things, but not so much believing in this. And then after World War II, what had happened is, uh, in fact, it was probably mid to late 50s, 56, there was a group that looked at some of the fundamentals and saying, you believed in the five, but you've added to it five, 10, 15 more things, and so that you've become somewhat legalistic and you've lost a sense of love. And so a new group developed out of that called the Evangelicals. Billy Graham was a big uh, uh, proponent of that as one of the early leaders. And those Evangelicals believed in those same five things, okay? Now, a study was done recently by Barna, the Barna Research Group, um, where they surveyed Evangelicals today to see, do we still believe in all of those basic things? Um, I'm going to read through the list that was included in that, their, their definition uh, of the basics, of the fundamentals. And as you and I go through it, ask yourself, do I believe that? Do I buy into that? Do I endorse that? Do I embrace that? Here's the list. They define the biblical worldview as believing that absolute moral truth exists. In other words, there is truth. Do you believe that? Or do you believe that truth is subjective? Secondly, he says, the Bible is totally accurate in all of the principles it teaches. Satan is considered to be a real being or force, not merely symbolic. A person cannot earn their way to heaven by trying to be good or do good works. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on earth, and God is the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the world who still rules the universe today. Now, <clears throat> that's a basic list, Right? There's nothing in there that, uh, of, of, of secondary nature that's still important about maybe the exercise of the gifts or the, the, the timing of the uh, second coming of Jesus, the rapture of the church. There's nothing in there on that. If you were to, to do an educated guess, what percentage of evangelicals today would embrace that whole list? Would it shock you to know that it's under 50%? And would it shock you to know that it's 17%? And even as I give that number, I'm asking the question of, of our own sheep in this flock. If, if, um, if we don't believe that, I've not done my job in teaching the importance of these things because our beliefs will shape our behavior. That's the way it works. But we have to believe. We have to believe. We sing these songs, these creedal songs. We believe in God the Father. We believe in Christ. Do we believe those? We must, folks. And if you find yourself, you know, a couple of those I, I, don't, I, couldn't, I can't buy into. Let's dig into them together then and show the importance of Jesus being the sinless Son of God. Okay? Beliefs will shape behaviors. And that sets us up so we don't discard the Old Testament. It's all very important. And Jesus says, I'm the fulfillment of that. Now, the second thing he says to them is in verse 19. Verse 19 sets up verse number 20. And can you imagine being uh, listening in that group and you're a disciple? Or imagine if you're listening in that group and you're a Pharisee. Let me read verse 19. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments 
and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Well, the, the Pharisees, it's a group of within um, the Jewish religious culture that believed in the Old Testament laws, 613 laws, and they, they're a separate group. They lived in their communities together. If you wanted to become one of those Pharisees, you'd have to sign a, kind of a, a vow of obedience, that you were going to obey them all. And then they would watch you, observe you for 30 days to see if you did. It was, but it was not just the commands. It was their interpretation of them, and it was their additions to them. For example, if you, um, if you, were, uh, if, if you were praying and you had to pray, and if you were following a Pharisee along the road, you'd always tell who he was, because when a time came to pray at a certain time of the day, he'd stop there. And it could be right in the middle of an intersection. He'd stop to pray. In their writings, if you had a, a foot in the stirrup of a horse, but it was time to pray, you had to withdraw the foot until you finished praying. If you were a carpenter, you're not hammered and you were doing construction work, and it's time to pray, you drop the hammer until you finish your prayer. If, even if it says, if you have a snake wrapped around your ankle, and it's time to pray, you pray and finish your prayer before you get rid of the snake. Kind of a motivation for shorter prayers, I think. <laughs> so they added all of these things. And even, uh, even with regards to the Sabbath, the restrictions on what you couldn't do on the Sabbath, they had 39 different categories of descriptions of things you couldn't do. And you can imagine, along comes Jesus, and he heals somebody on the Sabbath. They say, Wait a minute, you're misunderstanding the law, they would say to Jesus. Jesus said, no, you're the false teacher. Jesus never condemned them, at least in my study, he never condemned the Pharisees for their obedience. Never did. But he would challenge them with regards to three or four other things. He would challenge them with their hypocrisy. He says, you're doing it. In, the, in Matthew chapter 23, seven times he uses the word hypocrite. He says, you, you put on this mask, like a theatrical performance, and you're doing your righteousness. You're giving your prayers and all of this to be seen of men. It's a theatrical performance. And he said, when you do that, you have your reward. It's the praise of men. How long does the praise of men last, folks? Can you say nanosecond? The second thing Jesus would highlight in the life of the Pharisees is the hypocrisy, number one. But secondly, they would major on the minors. And he said in the 23rd chapter, he says, you tithe your spices, your cumin and so forth. And so they would go to the spice rack when it time, came time to giving. And they would take the bottles of spices and pour them out and mark off the tithe down to the very granules. But he says, you've forgotten the weightier matters of the law, like love and justice and righteousness. Do people today still do that? Yeah. The third thing he challenged them on he says, you're doing all this, but it's the outside stuff. It's not inside. It's outside, and he uses two pictures. The one is of a cup. He says, you wash the, in, uh, the outside of the cup, but the inside is dirty. Now, all of you that are coffee drinkers, anybody here? Coffee drinkers, hot chocolate, doesn't matter, hot cider. If you have a choice to wash the inside or the outside, which are you going to go with? Every time you're going to wash the inside, right? They were doing, he said, you're doing the outside. He says, you're white as sepulchers. He says, you're like graves. But when people go by, you're the, you're the grave. They see it all cleaned up and whitewashed. But he says, inside you're dead man's bones. Horrible. Horrible. <clears throat> so Jesus was challenging him in these three areas. He goes on and gives them verse 20. And this is shocking. Let me close with this. Verse 20. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness or that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
And when he read verse, or said verse 19, the Pharisees said, yeah, that's us. That's us. <clears throat> we don't relax any part of the law. In fact, we double down. We add to it, and we demand it of others. We're great. And Jesus said to everybody that day, unless your righteousness is greater than the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees had to be shocked and saying, like, what are you talking about? And the disciples had to be saying, I can't live up to that standard. I can't fast. I fast Monday afternoon between lunch and dinner. These guys are fasting twice a, a week, two days a week. I can't do that. And now Jesus is saying, if your righteousness isn't greater than theirs, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. And then he raises the bar again. In chapter 5 and verse 48, at the end of this chapter, he says, and you must be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. What? How do you do that? Anybody here made it through today without a sin? It's early yet. <laughs> and what Jesus is saying to them, you know, you got to be perfect. And the whole law, the purpose of the law, according to Galatians chapter 3, was a schoolmaster to show us that we couldn't live by the law. You can't climb a mountain of self-righteousness. You can't. You'll never get there. And the Pharisees were doing the outside here. The Pharisees were doing the outside. They're, they're cleaning up the outside thinking that their obedience would secure them a spot in the kingdom of heaven. But they didn't have the belief system. There are other people today even who have the belief system, but they don't have the life. In other words, they've made a, a profession of faith. They've prayed a prayer. But nothing happened. And maybe months, perhaps even years have gone by. And when that happens, one of the two things could be true. One is that they made a true profession of faith and believed. But they never got into the Word of God to grow. They never got into a Bible study. They never had a mentor. They were never discipled. And it's, it's a horrible thing. And maybe, maybe that's your case. You said, I have a profession of faith, but my life is not discernibly different than the world's then the next step for you is to get involved in a group, to get involved in our devotions or do study on your own, to, to get the, the Bible into your heart and your life so the Holy Spirit can change you to be more like Jesus. Or the second thing is true. And that is the, the words that were prayed were never prayed from the heart. Were never prayed with commitment where Jesus Christ would become our Savior and our Lord. And it gives a false hope. You say, well, what do I do? How do I know? There's a whole book of the Bible that was given to help answer that question. It's called 1 John. Five little chapters. I would encourage you to read it and see what God does in your own heart, either convincing you through his spirit that you're a follower of Jesus or showing you by his spirit, convicting you that perhaps you're not. So we'll live our lives from the inside out. That was what Jesus was saying to a group of people who um, were obedient, but it was all outside. It was all hypocritical. He said, no, you've got to believe and believe in me, the perfect one. I love 2 Corinthians chapter um, 5 and verse 21, where it says, but God made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God. So stop climbing the mountain. You don't have enough time uh, except Jesus as Savior. And Jesus will give you the, his righteousness. God will. If you don't know Jesus yet, that's my encouragement to you today. Come to know him. If you even have any doubts, talk to somebody after the service. And get this resolved. This is the, the most important thing in the entire world.
is that we know him. Or if you, caught, if you find yourself stuck, maybe caught in external systems, and there's no reality in your heart and life, well, let's get this right with God, either through salvation or through recommitment. Get his word into our hearts and lives. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would challenge us and change us through the power of your word. Father, I pray that if those, if those here today who may not know you yet, that, Father, today you would draw them to yourself in such a powerful way. Father, thank you for delivering us from self-righteousness. Thank you for, for the gift of Jesus, who through his life gave us life. Through his death gave us hope. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, stand together, shall we, as we worship.